Welcome to Promise Fellowship. Everybody who's here, welcome, welcome. So, Lord, we just thank you for meeting us here. God, we thank you for every person who's here, and we just ask that your uh, presence would be known. God, we pray that that you would be glorified. We ask that you would just reveal yourself to us in a great way this day. God, I pray that we would all um, just lay aside the cares of this week, of this this life. God, I pray that our hearts would be just in tune to to hearing your voice and God, just speak to us. God, I pray that you'd speak to Dawn, speak through Dawn, speak to Tricia, speak through Tricia. God, I pray this night that we would encounter you and that we wouldn't be the same. When we leave, we would know, we would know that we are changed by the power of your blood, by the power of your spirit, by the power of your word, by the power of your name, Jesus. We have come to worship you, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your all for us, and may we just give you our all in return. Just have your way, Jesus. We're going to just sing that first verse of, Oh, the blood of Jesus. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for your willingness to come and give up your life for us that greatest gift of love you gave your life to give us eternal life and we just praise you in jesus name if you guys want to stand you can like i say if you feel like you want to come to the altar you can do that too i'm gonna to sing of the blood See the sun. 
going to go ahead and have Kevin come on up. Kevin's going to do five minutes. Is that correct? He's looking at me like, okay. I couldn't read his look. Yes, you. That's the schedule. <laughs> Subject to change always. So, uh, good evening, church. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and continue with uh, how obedience brings blessings. And uh, I don't know if all of you were here the first time I did it, but it's pretty it's pretty good um, how God blesses us for being obedient. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we just love you, and we're thankful that you woke us up today. And we just ask that you continue to let us be obedient, more obedient. And we just love you, Lord. And just wherever you want this to go, lead me in that direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I um, I did some um, some research, and Adam sat down with me and, and helped me a little bit with this. So um, about how obedience brings us blessings. So God often rewards others <clears throat> rewards others in particular that are close to us. I forgot my glasses, so bear with me. Um, I can barely read my own writing. I'm I'm getting blind. So uh, as a result of our obedience, for example, when a father obeys the Lord, his entire family reaps the reward of God's blessings. And likewise, a child's obedience will bless his or her parents. Amen? Amen. Obeying the covenant is meant to be a source of blessing, prosperity, joy, and health. The rewards for obedience are clear. You will be... You will be blessed wherever you go. Your children will be blessed. God will protect you. He will grant you abundant prosperity. Everything you set your hand on will be successful. The Lord will help you to stand out. And other reasons. Following God's plan for our lives means being in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. We all know that. God, we should not just call on God when we're in trouble or we're scared or something bad happens in our lives and we say, oh, God, I need you. We need God every day, every moment of the day. And that's what prayer without ceasing means. He wants you to rely on him. Uh, make this, he wants to help you make your decisions, your daily decisions. So we shouldn't worry about tomorrow or the day after. The word says, for today is sufficient in its own troubles. Amen? Amen. Okay. Follow the commands he puts on your heart. That's a big deal. Um, you know, our pastor Chris, he's talked about, um, you know, he gets that feeling, and then he doesn't do it, and then God gives him an oppor another opportunity, then he does it. You know, so it's important to follow your heart because uh, if you're obedient to God and he puts something on your heart, then we should do it. Uh, walk up and pray with somebody. Um, give somebody some food. Um, the word also says we never know. We might be entertaining angels. Amen. Amen. So it's important to follow your heart. So being active, be actively reading the word. Um. I don't read it enough. I need to read it more. I'm just going to be honest about it. Um, my daily life um, gets in the way sometimes. And that's, a, that's the wrong thing to do. 
Um, I always start out, you know, thankful, and I mean well, but sometimes my day gets in the way, and uh, I, I don't pray enough, I don't talk to God enough, and I don't read my Bible enough. Uh, I need to get better at that. These are things that we work on, right, little by little. We get better, and uh, we rely on God to help us get better. And, you know, as long as I'm getting better, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm not where I was. I'm where I am now. And I'll be where I am tomorrow, depending on God, what God wants me to do, right? That's the way I see it. Seek a godly community. That could be anything. That could be where you live. That could be your church, most importantly, uh, your friends. Um, you know, if you tend to hang out with people that aren't Christ-like, what do you what are you going to do? You're going to want to be part of that crowd uh, before you know it. You know, you're off on a, a bad path, right? So that's important to uh, uh, a Christ-like, be around people that are Christ-like. Um, I've been down that road, and it's easy to get off the path. So obey the truth, which is God's word, amen? So we all know, we all know the truth. And the truth shall. What? All right. Okay. So when we love God and keep his commandments, Jesus says, I will love him and manifest in him. So obedience leads to revelation for us it, it, from Jesus. He's going to open our eyes and open our hearts and uh, reveal to us his plan for us. It could be daily. You know, mine's daily. I get downloaded daily. I don't have this grand plan, you know, of, of anything. I just know what he wants me to do, and that's pretty much what I do. So if we, if we persevere in obedience out of love for the Father, he will reward us with the fruit of obedience, which is eternal life united with him. I can't think of anything better than that. Um, the worst thing I could think of was, depart from me, I never knew you. And I don't want to go through that. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's life and the rest of your whatever in hell. And we, we don't want that. So, um, faith, I think as we increase in faith, we become more obedient. Um, that's just the way. It happens for me. Um, you know, like I said, if we keep getting better little by little, we'll become more faithful, more obedient. Better things are going to happen in our lives. Um, the more we trust God and stop doing, trying to do it ourselves. I get in my way a lot. But, you know, I complicate things that uh, should never be complicated. I think about what I'm going to do tomorrow and, and, you know, oh, no, you know, and worry and, that's just not the way to live your life. So I'm, I'm learning to slow down, take it a little easy, um, slow down on work. I'm a little bit of a workaholic, so I kind of slowed down on that a little bit. In the last couple weeks, um, kind of relaxed and done a lot more Jesus work than I have in quite a while, and it, it's it's good. It's all good. So um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, man, we just love you and we praise you for everything and thank you for being in our lives and your will be done in our lives and not ours. We just ask that, that you help us not to get in our own way. And we just love you and we lift you high. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Obedience is key, right? So just our little, everybody put your O up. When you have that O up, walking in obedience, you have that covering. But what happens when you disobey? The gate opens, right? And get the consequences. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my my refuge. That's the only place to be.
disobedience, you're going to get consequences. Okay, so here we go. Any prayer requests? Jerry. Okay. 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 Pastor Steve. Okay. Okay. Grace, did you have one? Her kids, yes. It's always on Grace's heart and probably our other people's hearts as well. So brothers, family, And your scripture reference was Acts 4. Thank you. Others? Okay. Okay. Trisha? Yep. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Pour it out. He is. He is. Mom? Anybody have an unspoken request? <laughs> Two hands raised. Okay. Anybody else? I do have a specific request. My right arm has been bothering me for the last couple of months. Well, yesterday I washed the vehicle. <laughs> And now I have, like, something, I don't know if that's what tennis elbow feels like or what, but achy elbow. <sighs> Got to work harder. I just hadn't washed it in a while, I guess, that motion. Doing other motions, lifting bags and kids and bags and kids and just not that one. Anybody else? Did you have one? Okay, well, I'm going to pray. Something else? Nope, okay. Well, Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to come directly to you, God. We thank you, Jesus, that you took our, our pain, our sorrow, our sickness, our state of being lost when you went on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of life. God, I pray that you would um, just heal hurts and give strength to the places where strength needed needs to be. God, your word says, by your stripes we are healed, we were healed. God, I pray for Pastor Steve and his whole family. God, I just we speak healing and life into that house. God, we thank you for being the great physician. God, we thank you for what you've done in Pastor Don's body and body, soul, and spirit, God, for where you've brought him and where you're taking him, God, we thank you for your healing power. God, for Grace and all of her children, and Richard, God, I thank you for um, the the diligence of this mother, this mother's heart's cry, God, that all of her children would be in your house, God. I, I thank you for drawing them, Lord, in a, in a greater way. God, may they hear your voice and may they respond. Thank you, Jesus. And for Matthew and his petition for his family, his son, his brothers in the community, friends, people with addictions, God, we just ask this day, this day, that you would show some sort of just an answer. God, we thank you that you are working. We thank you that you hear every heart's cry. And God, we thank you that um, you know our petitions even before we ask, but you do say to ask. And God, for for many people who are... um, suffering from addictions and struggles god most people have some sort of something that they're going through and lord we just ask this day that um that you would descend god we know that you're here i pray that people would actually move towards you i speak that scripture frequently about as we draw near to you you'll draw near to us and god we're here to draw near to you 
God, I pray that even people here, even myself, God, the things that we're struggling with, God, I thank you for freedom. God, I thank you that you have all the answers. God, I thank you that you are with us. You're never, ever far. You're, you're right there. You promise to never leave us nor forsake us. And God, I thank you for the situation at work for Dawn. Lord, you know all every aspect of it. And Lord, we thank you for working all things out for your glory. And God, um, for the unspoken that my mom has and all the people who, who have just not spoken or even acknowledged, but God, we've all got something on our heart. Lord, I pray that you would just show your power, God, your perfect timing in all things. We thank you, God, that we can trust you at all times. For my elbow, God, I thank you for helping it to be better than it was earlier. And God, as Trisha prayed for the awakening. God, I pray that you would awaken us even in this room right now. Holy Spirit, we just, we invite you to be here in our midst. We know that you're here. We thank you for, for meeting us, for bringing to our remembrance things that we've learned in Scripture, the truths of, of your word, God. May we have uh, just a Holy Spirit encounter. May we have a a conviction if there's places that we need to repent. God, may there be a godly sorrow. May we humble ourselves before you. May we resist the enemy. May we be ready brides. May we not be on the outside. May we be in. Thank you, God. And may we not miss this moment. God, even speaking to the hearts right now. Everybody at the sound of my voice right now, or even later if they watch the video, God, I pray right now that people would encounter you. And with that, that there would be a, a change, that there'd be a yielding, that your will would be our will that our will would be yours, that it would all boil down to your kingdom come and your will be done, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for meeting us where we are. We praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Joshua, I'm going to have you, do you mind doing the offering right now? Um, you know, giving back to the Lord. Everything that we have is from him. It's come from him. It's because... You know, he's given us abilities to go out and work, right, Kevin? I mean, it's his sustaining power. Things can happen just in a moment where we may be, something can be taken away from us. And God, everything that we have, it's every good gift comes from you. And God, we praise you. We thank you for meeting the needs of every person here. God, I pray that as we offer tithes or offerings, God, I pray that you would just bless the giver, that you would... Um, use whatever comes in, Lord, to be furthering your kingdom. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. God, we praise you and we thank you for this time that we can worship you even now with our giving. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Mr. Hay. Good evening, everyone. Have you been blessed? Amen. What a beautiful uh, worship uh, music we've had, and, and uh, what a testimony. Thank you. It, it's Kevin, right? It, Kevin, thank you so much for that. That touched my heart, Kevin. I appreciate that. And, and uh, we are so blessed, aren't we? So blessed. My uh, scripture today, uh, we are going to be uh, in Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, with you there uh, will be Matthew 24. This is a, a message that I preached here uh, last year, 
and uh, I think the timeliness of the of things is uh, appropriate that I add a little bit on to it and uh, give it to you here again. Matthew 24, and it says, uh, verse 7, For na- nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And if we go over to uh, verse 43, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in, in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered the house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. What if this was your last day and there was no tomorrow for you? You know, someday Jesus is going to come and it will be the last day for all of us, won't it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open up your word and we study your will for us, Lord, I just pray that you will be with us in spirit and truth. I pray that you will illuminate our hearts and our, our, our minds and, and touch our hearts, Lord, and, and help us to just instill a love, even deeper love, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, February 5th in Turkey. A lot of people went to bed that night thinking that tomorrow is going to be just another day. Maybe another day of work, another day of cooking meals and washing, going to the market, just another day of, of uh, the routine, uh, maybe a uh, Maybe it was a special day. Maybe it's someone's birthday. And then that night, uh, early the next morning, 4.17 a.m., when most everyone was still asleep, the ground began to shake. And that quake was 7.8 on the Richter scale. And uh, many, many lives were lost. Many buildings collapsed. And then a second quake later on that day, 7.7 on the Richter scale, 1.24 p.m. You know, that quake was felt as far away as Egypt, 876 miles away. That's like, that's like from here to Bakersfield. Imagine that. And already this quake is the fourth costliest earthquake on record, $84 billion. And they haven't even added it all up yet. You know, I heard on the radio that uh, they've given up all hope for survivors. 40,000 people so far. And they expect 100,000 deaths. Because oftentimes afterwards, there's the disease and the starvation. The heartache. The death. The children. Imagining the people underneath that rubble. You know, when that crisis came, there was no second chance. I want you to hold on to that thought for a moment. You know, Luke uh, describes Jesus' first coming as quiet and, and Jesus mild and meek. But my friends, the second coming, when Jesus comes the second time, He will not be mild and meek. It'll be powerful. It'll be an event. It'll be in such magnitude that it will make that earthquake look like nothing. Jesus is coming back. And in the same way that angels proclaimed his first coming, there are three angels that proclaim his second coming. And let's go to Revelation 13. This is important because in Revelation is the last message of warning to the planet. It's the last message of warning to you. In chapter 13, it describes the evil trinity, the sea beast and the earth beast and the false prophet. And in verse 4, The whole point of chapter 13 
is kind of found in verse 4, and it says, And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Who did they worship? The dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. And chapter 13 is all about the evil that comes from these three entities. And then there's chapter 14. And chapter 14 is the opposite of chapter 13. 13 and revelation 13 describes worldwide error but revelation 14 describes the worldwide gospel and we'll start in verse 3 or verse 6 and these are the three messages here and i saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The everlasting gospel. You know, what is the everlasting gospel? Well, it's the gospel that existed from the foundation of the earth and will exist forevermore. The, the everlasting gospel is that Jesus created us. We were created by him. We are his. We belong to him. And then we sinned and we rebelled. We went against God. But out of a love that humans just cannot fathom, God came to earth. He became like us, but yet he was still God. Jesus became like us. And he died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3 tells us that. But you know, a dead Savior doesn't do anybody any good. And so after three days, he was resurrected because he lived a sinless life, the life that we cannot live. He lived for us. And because he lived this life, the grave couldn't hold him. He couldn't stay in that grave. And he was resurrected. His resurrection is the guarantee for us that we can be resurrected if we believe on him. If we have faith, then that is given to us his righteousness by faith in Jesus alone. But that took place 2,000 years ago. And people are still dying. And people are still in their graves. So part of the everlasting gospel, and this is really the point of revelation, that Jesus is coming again and he will, he's coming to get his own. He's coming to get our loved ones. He hasn't forgotten them. And, and when he comes, the angels will come and find your loved ones. They'll find you. God knows where you are. And he knows who you are. That's the everlasting gospel. Praise God. And, and, and then it says, fear God and give glory to him. Fear God. Fear God means that God is awesome. And, and what fearing God means is it puts things into proper perspective. You know, when, when, when I was teaching, sometimes the kids would get a little confused. And they would think that, you know, maybe they were the teacher. And I'd have to, like, explain it to them, no, I'm the teacher. I tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. I give you the work, and you do the work, and then I correct the work. And they get it mixed up. But I'm the teacher, and, and they, they needed to respect me. And to fear God means to respect him and to give him glory. And it has a special meaning in uh, Revelation. And it... it, it creates this right relationship with God. And giving him glory uh, suggests obedience to the commandments. I love that, that discussion about obedience that we just had. A person comes to fear God after recognizing the Lord's great power and his works. And fearing God leads one to repentance. Thus to fear God is to take him seriously and make a turnaround in your life and enter into a correct relationship with him and to be totally committed. And then God is glorified through a life characterized by obedience to his commandments. Praise God. 
This obedience is not out of duty. But it's out of love. That's true obedience, isn't it? To do something out of love. You know, God's image and God's reputation has taken a beating of late. The devil wants us to think all sorts of things about God. But my friends, God is awesome. And God is big. And God is greater than any trouble that you possibly can have. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes verse 12. Right here at the end. And it's going to be 13 and 14. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, this is the end of it all. This is the summation of it all. Fear God and what? Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You see, all throughout the book of Revelation, Revelation is like a summation of the rest of the Bible. And if you look throughout the book of Revelation, you can see places where it refers back to the Old Testament. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. My friends, there's a judgment. There is a judgment. Don't let anyone tell you differently. But notice that the timing of the judgment here is before the second coming, while the gospel is being proclaimed. There will be a judgment. That judgment will draw a clear line of demarcation between who are God's people and who are Satan's. I don't know if you can feel it or not. But I feel a tug one of two ways. And I think as time goes on, there are going to be two sides. There are going to be two camps. You know, the end time judgment is part of the everlasting gospel. And to God's end time people, the word judgment is good news. If you're, if you're, if, if you're in Christ, judgment is not something to fear. But if you're unfaithful to the unfaithful, the judgment is a thing of terror. Are you scared today? Are you afraid? Well, you're in the right place. Promise Community Fellowship. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and you have no fear because Jesus is promised. And notice it says here, And worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You know, the, the issue in the end time is worship. What did we just read in Revelation 13? The, these entity worshipped who? Satan, the dragon. And, and who are we supposed to worship here? God, the creator of heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You know, the atheist and the evolutionist want no part of this. And this, this, this language here also points back to the Old Testament, and specifically in Exodus 20, verse 11. The fourth commandment, In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them is, and the rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The fourth commandment requests that people keep the Sabbath because God created. That's why. It's a memorial to his creative power. John is just echoing what Moses told the Israelites just before they entered the promised land. And my friends, we are at the threshold of the promised land. And Moses' words were to fear the Lord, obey him, keep his commandments, worship only him. What should we be preaching? What should you be sharing with your friends. Well, you should be sharing the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give him glory. Worship the creator. And, and we are in the process of judgment now. I believe we're in the judgment now. Verse 8. The second angel. And there followed another angel. Angels are just messengers in the Bible. 
They're, uh, they're, they're beings, of course, but they, they give a message saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, this goes back to the Tower of Babel. You guys remember the story of the Tower of Babel? After the flood, right? God sent a worldwide flood, saved Noah and the ark, and, and then the ark came down, and they started populating the, the, uh, the world again. And people became afraid. They didn't trust God. And so they said, well, we're going to build ourselves a tower. And we're going to make this tower so high that when God gets upset again, that we'll have a way of escape. And we'll get, we'll get above that. It sort of reminds me of these, uh, what are they called, uh, tsunami towers out at the beach. Have you ever seen those? Pictures of them? I don't know who they figure they're going to put up there. It's, there's only enough room for a few people. I guess maybe the mayor and the city council, I guess. Maybe common people like us won't, won't, won't get up there. But, but they, they figured that they were going to get away with it and they did this because of fear see babel means confusion babbling comes from babel it means confusion and it says in the bible here fallen fallen is babylon the great the first angel is a call to worship the creator the second is a repudiation of all systems and schemes that uh, religious or otherwise that run counter to allegiance to christ See, Babylon is a metaphor that describes an end-time, worldwide error that is secular, but it's also religious. Chapter 13 describes it as being made up of this satanic trinity, the dragon and the sea beast, the, 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 the earth beast, all arrayed against God's people. And Babylon represents all human plans to frustrate God's will. Babylon is in opposition to the everlasting gospel. So where the everlasting gospel is salvation through faith, for example, Babylon is salvation by works. It's the opposite. It's a counterfeit. You know, it's been said that we are all living out our belief systems. You know, you look at how people are. Mean people have a mean belief system. Loving people, their belief system is grounded in love. You know, we're all just living out what's in here. We have to be. You can't lie. And so... Babylon creates confusion. It creates bad results. You know, uh, I used to work, I think I told you this story before, but I, I used to work at a, a, a county park in Point Roberts, Washington. And uh, my job was, yeah, I was in, high, I was in college. So I had to mow lawns, I had to pick up garbage, I had to clean restrooms. And one of the, the things I hated the most was at dusk. The park closed at dusk, but people just wanted to party. And they wanted to go down at the beach, and they wanted to burn up the firewood that they weren't supposed to burn up, and they, they, they'd be drunk. And I'm telling you, you can't reason with a drunk. You can't. You know, so I'd go down there and say, you know, you have to leave. That didn't go over too well. So eventually it just it got to the point where it was like, leave or I call the sheriff. No, leave, call the sheriff. And I would literally have to turn around and start walking toward the telephone. And then they would leave. You see, they were, they, they were drunk. And you can't reason with somebody like that and so Babylon is described here because she 
made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They're confused. They don't understand. Babylon has seduced the nations to side with the, the satanic trinity in Revelation 13 by means of deception. And the call for all Christians is found in 18, 1 through 4. Revelation 18, 1 through 4. And it says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having a great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen and has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and hold every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That's the second angel. What should we be preaching? Babylon has fallen. The everlasting gospel is what we want to be following. And come out of her, my people. You don't want anything to do with Babylon. And then the third angel, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Verse 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And the worship, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receive the mark of his name. Notice that here we have worship. What does verse 7 say? Worship him that made heaven and earth. And here we have in verse 11, who worship the beast and his image. These are opposites. I want to be worshiping the God of heaven. Amen. I want to be worshiping the God who created heaven and made heaven. That's the message of the third angel. Mark of the beast on the right hand of the forehead serves an identification for the worshipers of the satanic trinity. And this is opposite to the seal of God. Who are you going to worship? And who's Whose side are you on? And what is the sign of that? Is it a computer chip? Bigger than a computer chip. Is it a vaccine? Bigger than a vaccine. It's literally worshiping the God of heaven or this satanic trinity. The core issue in the book of Revelation is worship. The wine of wrath. And it talks about the cup of wrath, unmixed, undiluted, and it's a symbol of God's judgment. And it makes me think of Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? And so what are we to preach? Well, we're to preach that you can't sit on the fence. The language of the third angel is intended to move God's people from one place to to another the the message of the third angel is designed to divide into the sheep and the goats the wheat and the tares which side are you going to be on you know the beast of revelation 13 uses fear to make people conform to his demand for worship see the beast the only way he can get worship is to coerce people to worship, is to make them worship. But the true God, we worship God out of love, with obedience to his commandments. That's the difference. In Revelation 14, 12, and 13, who are God's people? Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are those who keep God's commandments, God's ten commandments that were written by his own hand. And the faith of Jesus. They have faith. They have the righteousness by faith. 
my friends, whatever group. Now, now there's groups out there that preach the commandments, but they don't preach the faith. There's groups out there that preach faith, but they don't preach the commandments. My friends, whatever group pulls these two things together in the last days will blast forth the everlasting gospel. It's these two things together that, that, make, it, that make it work. Revelation 14. 14. And, and we know that this is right before, right before the second coming because verse 14 talks about the harvest. Jesus is coming, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat like one of the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. My friends, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is almost here. We are at the door. You know, those people in Turkey and Syria, you know, they went to bed that night, February 5th, thinking that tomorrow would be just another day. My friends, we cannot avoid the warnings. We cannot ignore the warnings. Do not ignore the warnings. My friends, it's February 5th, and tonight Jesus could come. We want nothing to do with Revelation 13 and Babylon. We want to be among those who are described in Revelation 14. As Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. You cannot serve both God and the devil, one or the other. The devil wants to distract Christians and divert our attention to foolish things. All you got to do is, is look at any news source that you want. And it's filled with foolishness compared to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. We are so easily deluded. In these last days, we cannot be off topic. We have to preach the everlasting gospel. Satan wants us to believe righteousness by works. Christ is righteousness by faith. Satan is obedience out of fear. Christ, obedience out of love. Satan, when you sin, you ought to feel perpetual shame and condemnation. What does Jesus say? I have forgiveness for you, and I have love and acceptance. Satan says the commandments are done away with. Jesus says God's people will have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen? Revelation 14 is a message that we have to complain, uh, proclaim. Jesus is coming soon to get his own. He, Jesus describes him as the remnant. What is a remnant of cloth? It's the end of the, the roll of cloth, right? It's the last of the roll. That's just like the first of the roll, amen? The last day church will be like the first church in Jesus' time. They'll be true and they'll be pure. The remnant are those that accept Jesus by faith alone and respond to his love and obedience by faith. Uh, acceptance by obedience to God's commandments. Those that have been redeemed are purchased with Jesus' own blood. And soon Jesus is coming back to get his own. My favorite scripture. Let's turn it. Let's turn there. First Thessalonians 4. I know I go to this a lot. But this is our great hope. This is our great hope. 
1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Could be tonight. You know, this could be your last night here. Praise God. Praise God. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. It's not going to be a secret, my friends. It's going to be loud. It's going to be powerful. Peter, Peter describes it as the ground shaking and elements melting. This is no secret. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. There'll be an earthquake, all right. There'll be an earthquake to break open every grave of God's people. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Imagine that. Can you feel your feet getting a little light? <laughs> Praise God. And, and people rising out of the ground and meeting them and, and angels bringing your loved ones to you or you to your loved ones, holding you by the hand and, and taking you there. Praise God. And it says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, the best thing about heaven is, thou, the, is Jesus will be there. It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But my friends, we are not going to come out of the grave with cancer. Mm. We're not going to come out of the grave with bad eyesight. We're not going to come out of the grave with sickness and, and injury. We're going to come out of the grave whole. And Paul says, at that moment, we put on immortality. What a day that will be. I wonder what would be worth missing that resurrection. I can't think of anything. Can you? Let us all be there together, amen? and spend eternity together. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, this world is sick, and it's dying. And Lord, you hold the keys to life. Lord, help us to, each and every day, give you our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you will come soon. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Elizabeth, can you grab some batteries there? I have actually a uh, Revelation song is one of our songs in the lineup. But I think I would like to do Come Lord Jesus. Let's towards the back. If you want to find it, I don't have it in the it's not in the lineup, but it's in your book. Sarah Elizabeth, can you go towards the end of the PowerPoint? I have it at the very end in a standby position. So we're going to sing that and then we'll go up and sing our other songs after we sing this. You find it? Not yet. Yes? Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. It's after goodness of God, after rescue. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for uh, meeting us where we are. 
God, we thank you that you're coming back. We thank you that you are on the throne. And there's no surprises for you. There's no surprises with you. Lord, we just ask this day that you'd have your way in our lives. And God, I pray that we would draw near. We're inviting you. We're inviting you to have your way in our lives this day. Thank you, God, for hearing our petitions. God, I thank you for um, for giving us for giving us the promises in your word, for giving us the signs that you are coming. God, I thank you for the gifts that you've given us, the truths that you've given us. God, I pray that, again, that there would be hearts of repentance, that um, that your spirit would draw Not only with the drawing, God, I pray that we would walk in obedience. Transform us, God. And as we worship now, God, I pray that you would just have your way. In Jesus' name. King of glory, precious land, heaven's bright.
could take it up to uh, the more Ezekiel. So really, what is it that he's wanting from us? It's everything. Everything. And the more we seek him, the more we are going to find him. And the more we find him, the more we're going to love him, and we're, the more we're going to know how much he truly loves us. His love is unconditional. He just, he wants us. He wants us to come to him as we are and just let him take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. So here we go. because it's in the quiet time where we can hear you. God, you can speak in a crowded room. I know that you can because you have to me, but and I know that you do to others. But Lord, I just pray that as we just we're purposeful about just being with you, God, I thank you that you'll meet us right where we are. I'm going to sing none but Jesus.
we would allow you to, to lead us. We are learning about obedience that brings about that blessing. Obedience comes in steps and it comes in stages. It comes in enduring the obedience, the pressure that comes with walking in obedience when no one else will. But when we hear your voice and we learn to listen, no matter what storm comes, we're going to listen to you because we've heard your command. We've heard your direction. So, Lord, as we learn about that today, God, I pray that we wouldn't leave here the same, that, that God, you are preparing a people, a ready people. You're preparing us. Whether we just came for a little bit or we're coming for a lot, God, you are preparing us. God, you have a select group here today. to direct them, what you're wanting to correct in them, or to correct around them, or to direct a thought that is a, is a lie, but you want to lead them into that truth to be able to direct them, to correct them, that God, that they can make it safely through the trial, through the storm, through it, through it. So my question when I came up here, it, it really is, are you ready to die? If the storm hits, are you ready to die? Are you ready to die to your flesh and not run back? Are you ready to die? Are you ready to really live and allow him to show you how to walk things by faith and to believe him that he will lead you into this life more abundant? You're not here for no reason. You're here on purpose today. So Holy Spirit, just take over. Just breathe mightier and greater than my breath that I can even hear myself. Holy Spirit, just go and do what you do best. The enemy takes our words and twists it, but God, you take our words. You speak through us, and you, God, go and accomplish what you want accomplished in each person's life here today, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. We commit this time to you, Lord. Get the victory. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been talking about storms lately. We all go through different storms. I have... Um, I'm going to write the word storm up here. There was a guy who had a had a job of listening to God for a very long period of time of obedience. When everybody made fun of him, he had heard God and there was a storm that was coming, but he was preparing his family for that storm. Who was that? That was Noah. Okay. How about this guy's storm? Right before the cross, he was in a what? He was in a garden. Was that a storm? There's Jesus in that garden, pouring his heart out to the Lord. Is that a storm? That's a storm. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. We're all going to go through storms. They might look a little bit different, but they're storms, all right. Staying grafted into the vine during a storm is uh, something different. Most of the time, a storm hits, and we beeline it back into our flesh. Am I the only one? Okay. All right. We're not going to go back into our flesh. We're going to learn what God wants us to know because we have to pass through these storms by listening to him, by obeying his voice. It's really important that we begin to hear him uh, through his word, through dreams, through prophecy, whether the prophetic prophecy comes through the word that's going to be 100 percent guaranteed he's not going to lead us it's it's 100 percent accurate if we get a word outside of that prophesy in part we have a part but it's just a part so but we dreams we have visions revelation knowledge will come so when we go through a storm we need to begin to ask the lord god lead me what do you want me to know 
So we have a storm here that's coming up on two different people's houses. So we've got different storms, but they're still storms, and we need to learn to obey through the storm. God's going to bring about a greater victory. A lot of times when we're going through the storm, we are recalling what we lost. And I was talking to the Lord the other day, and he said to me, Trisha, I said, what if I don't listen to you in the, in the next season? And he said, then, then you won't be able to get to that place that you're desiring to get to with for me to do that work in you. And I said, but God, what if I obey you and I listen to you in that storm that's coming, the season? Because if God speaks prophetically to you, you know seasons will come. And he says, you have to listen to me in that season and don't let your heart get rebellious. But if you will listen to me and obey me, even when it hurts, even in that pain, you will gain more than what you feel are aware of or what you thought or what you thought you lost you will gain more than what you thought you lost so really listening to the lord in these seasons and not running back into your flesh or you might be very aware of your flesh but you're not running back to it but it's like this you're clinging to the cross and you're letting it die on you on the cross and you're running after the lord's heart in a situation so Verse 20, chapter 7, verse 20 says, Wherefore, by, my, by their fruit you will know them. By your own fruit of your mouth, you will know who you are, whether you're walking in the spirit or walking in your flesh. And if you're not letting it out, you're very then aware of your thought process. And if you're aware of your thought process, that's when you can lay down the devil's thoughts and pick up God's word and pick up his. That's the door. That, that, those are portals like, if you want, you want God to enter into your situation, surrender your thought life to him. Let him show you, yeah, you might be very aware that the enemy is around you. You start telling him where to go, and you begin to say, God, oh, my goodness, my heart wants to go that way with him and my thoughts, and God, I want to go that way with you, and there's this wrestling match. Romans 8.8. 8. But it says here, this is very scary to me because this is a point where um, Ke maybe it was Kevin that was saying, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, this right here was our conversation last night. In regards to when there is an awakening in your life where you really do begin to cast out demons and you really do begin to prophesy that the seasons and the storms, they amp up in a greater way than you've ever comprehended them before. And you don't want to get to that place where you become a worker of iniquity with knowing about the giftings. So not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Look at these two people. Noah was a human like us, going through a sinful season like us. It was horrible. Sodom, Gomorrah, all of those sinful things were all around. They've got the giants around. They've got lots of pressure. But yet he was obey obeying the will of God. He was obeying the voice of God. That was his will. He could hear what God said. God gave him the instructions. And by faith, he obeyed him. Not by feeling, by obedience, he obeyed him. In the garden, God, he felt the pressure. He felt what we would feel, the, the lack, the shame. He, if the enemy draws near to you, he feels dirty. You know what I mean? That shame he emits that stench, your, your whatever you did, he's going to emit it onto you like perfume, and you can feel it. And that's the pressure that was towards Jesus in the garden. I mean, he felt all of that, but uh, there was nothing that was found in him, but he still felt the pressure of it. And in that garden, he was saying, not my will, but what? Your will. There's a storm. There's a big storm around him, and there's a big storm that's about ready to hit both of them. There's some stores and some pressure before even entering into that, into that. And he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? God tells you he desires that we all will prophesy. And, in that, and did we cast out devils and in thy name done wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. So the enemy is very clever. He will begin to shut your mouth. He will try to close your mouth. He will try to go around people and close your mouth. And pretty soon, 
you can be now so angry at people that the enemy is using because they don't understand the enemy likes to use people as puppets. And when it all those storms and all those dem- devils drop down and you've got 30 people now around you that are operating in devil, in devil's words and they sound like Satan and you're aware of Satan and it shuts your mouth and you haven't learned to go through the storm to rise up above it, it can be some pressure that it can tank you and you can hate and you can disown God. And he's just saying, if you will just obey me in that, I'm going to rise you above this. I'm going to rise you above this, but if you can't understand with one devil operating in one person that hurt you, how are you going to be able to operate when you've got a crowd of tens of thousands of people crying out, crucify you, crucify you, and you say with one word in the name of Jesus, off, this, off of this n- nation, and the devils flee off of them, all of them hit the ground, and now you're going to believe me greater, but if you don't pass this test, you're not going to be able to see nations be set free by the demonic strongholds and the principalities. We're gonna, you're going to drop them. God will raise up people who have authority over the principalities that drop down on that one human that bugs you. God is growing us and and strengthening us, but there is a work of iniquity that Satan, he loves. And if you are not listening to the Lord while you're ministering, while you're worshiping, while you're sitting and while you're cleaning, the enemy of your own soul, I love to clean. But there was one day where I was like, I hope people are seeing me clean. And I was like, what in the world? Where'd that thought come from? Because I've not had that thought before. I just kind of like to clean and talk to the Lord. All of a sudden I heard it again, like, is everybody seeing me clean? I'm like, okay, this is seriously not my thought. This is serious. There is a devil here. And I was aware of that. And I even went and, and I, did I even talk to you, Tiffany, about it? Like, I love cleaning. I don't need anybody to come and help me clean. I mean, it's really nice. It's kind of like my love language, hint, hint, for my children. But if, if, I'm cleaning. It's the time that I spend with the Lord. Like when I go running or biking or exercise, I love Jesus. I love to hang out. It's like my time with him. So when you have a a thought that's not necessarily, I'm not going to receive every thought as my thought, like an airplane landing on my airplane thought. My pastor, when we were young, used to teach us, if you are aware that a plane is trying to land on, you can tell it, no, you will not land in Jesus' name. And that was one of those situations. And so there is a work of iniquity that you will see will go on when you begin to lay down your life for the Lord. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, now he's going to veer you into keep going through the storm, and you do the will of God, I will liken him to a wise man who's built his house upon a rock. You're building your house upon him. And the rain is going to descend upon that house of yours. And the floods are going to come. So if you're dreaming about floods, you're dreaming about wind, you're dreaming about the tidal wave, it's not exactly, it's not exactly just the enemy. Let God teach you and lead you in what he's trying to show you and raise you up in. And the rain's going to descend and the floods are going to come and the winds are going to blow and beat upon your house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. You're being pressurized. You're being being prepared for the calling, this will of God that he has for your life. He He has a desire that he placed upon your life. And when you say yes to the Lord, you say, yes, Lord, what is your will? What is your will for my life? And let's, let's say Noah for just a second. God, what is your will for my life? You know what? I, there's a storm that's coming, not for a while, but I want you to prepare your house. I want you to prepare your home to prepare them that there's, a, there's going to be a flood that's going to come, and I need you to build this boat, this ark for your family. I mean, Noah had to make steps of, steps of faith. He had to begin to obey what the Lord said, and he needed to learn to obey him not just one time. He needed to learn to obey him the first time he heard him and then to continue on. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, you're hearing God's word. God's word is the same word that he gave to Noah. Noah, this is what's going to happen. 
hey, guys, when you, girls, when you get into the word, this is what's going to happen, and it's going to happen. Prepare your home. And the rain is going to descend. And if you hear the sayings of mine and you will not listen, I'm going to liken you to a fool, and you're building your house on sand. And when the rain's going to come and the floods are going to come and the winds are going to blow and it's going to beat on your house, and it's going to fall, and it's going to greatly fall. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as just the scribes. He wasn't just talking just to talk it. He believed what he was saying, and he talked with authority, and they were beginning to understand that he had this revelation knowledge of, of what they were to do in a spiritual way, because in the physical, there's massive consequences in the spiritual realm when we do things in the physical realm. And so th they began to hear, they began to understand. Let's go to um, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, we're talking about Abraham. He had a storm. His child was a storm. So you're, you're loving the Lord, and he kind of puts this different pressure on you. It's kind of like being in that garden. He puts a pressure on you that's different. Chapter 22, verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and uh, said unto him, it's like a test, and he said unto him, Abraham, behold, here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. And I want you to get into the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering, one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he clave the wood and the burnt offering rose up and he went into the place of God told him then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place far off that's like prophetic when when God shows you that you're going to have to give up your child to him that's a soul different season when you have to trust that God has it that God is going to do it not you Abraham raised his son he trained his son to love God he was honoring God, and then he, God asked him to do something that he could see was going to be a death of his, like the death of his son. But really what it was was a position where God was giving Abraham a position. Are you going, are you going to trust me more than your love for your child? Do you love me more? And when God gets you in a position where most of us will love our child more than we love God, until God shows you the difference, most of us will cater to our kids' sin or our will for their life versus God's will for their life. And it's painful. But in that pain, you want God's will. Because when you have God's will, there's a blessing that's coming. There's a blessing that's greater than what you thought you lost. You didn't really lose. You just got pressurized and you got prepared. And then he gives you go more and you understand his will versus your own. And, and that's what this positioning of Abraham's heart was. Let's go to verse 16. And he said, um, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and has not withheld your son, thine only son, that in blessing, because you didn't hold back and you honored me, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply the seed of the stars of the heaven. Most people don't press into the Lord like this. Most people give up. But if you keep going and you keep pressing into the Lord and you keep believing him, God, I've never really believed you before, but I'm going to just believe you. Or you just keep going. God, I'm going to believe that there's going to be a breakthrough. I'm going to believe you, God, that you're a God that can provide. I'm going to believe that you're the God that can heal me, that you can restore something. I'm going to believe you for whatever that is. He will allow the storm to come to give you what you thought you lost and give you more. He's going to bless you in that thing. So he says no word is going to proceed unto you void, but it's going to go and accomplish that which you sent to accomplish. Verse 17, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. That was a promise for his son, that the seed, his seed, his children, his grandchildren, were going to possess the gate of his, the enemies. But it grows to the next generation. 
One more verse. And in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. It was an obedience that brought about the blessing upon the seed. Let's go to um, his son's life in chapter 26 where you see that in Abraham, so Abraham, he said, I'm gonna, you're going to possess the gate of the enemies. So just at the gate, you're going to possess the gate. Now watch what happens with your child because of your obedience, Abraham, because of our parents' obedience or starting your generation because of the generation where you began to obey the voice of the Lord. Okay, this is specific instructions for Isaac. He heard what God said. He was raised, watched his dad obey God. Isaac had some, he still had stink to deal with. God still has areas in our heart that he has, he will expose us. He will show us intimately. He might not expose it to everybody, but you will go on a crash course of your heart in these seasons. Chapter 26 because God doesn't want you to know, think that you can hide anything from him. Genesis chapter 26. Now listen to Isaac, how he obeys, how he has to hear God and he obeys. And there was a famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him. So the Lord appears to, to uh, him in this land. Do not go down into Egypt. So what was the instructions? Do not go down into Egypt. Do you remember in when Mary and Joseph, Joseph had the instructions to go down into Egypt. Joseph was stole or was sold and he went down into Egypt, but God was working in that. In this instruction, God told them, do not go down into what? Do not go down into Egypt. So don't what? Don't go to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For unto you and unto your seed I will give the countries, and I will perform the oath which I spoke unto your father. Abraham, there are some promises. If you have a, if you have a lineage that started, either right now it started, or you have a godly inheritance. You have a mama. Anybody else have a mom or a dad or a grandparent that loved the Lord? There's promises that are going to get fulfilled in our generations. There's a blessing of a generational blessing that comes on you. And, and don't be surprised when a famine hits because God is going to increase that blessing because it was promised to your parents or prom promised to a family member. And, and so sometimes we don't understand all of that. Let God teach you in that. So from Abraham, it went from the gates of the enemies to now he's saying, I, if you will stay here and honor me, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you all of these countries and I will perform the oath which I, which I gave to Abraham, your father, and I will make the seed to multiply as the stars of the heaven and I will give unto the seed all of these countries and in thy seed shall all of these nations. So now we have countries, we've got nations of the earth are going to be blessed because Abraham, because your dad obeyed my voice. And he kept my charges and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Okay, go all the way down to verse 12. It's a famine. There's a famine going on. Then Isaac sowed in the land, and he received the same year a hundredfold increase. And the Lord blessed him. A hundredfold increase during a famine? I mean, that is what happened to him when he obeyed the voice of the Lord. Let's go to... Um, Haggai, Haggai, however you guys say it. Sometimes we can look back at things, and this is where I want to encourage you. This is what the Lord was encouraging me. Sometimes I can look back and I can think, what if I wouldn't have, why God, why God did that have to happen? Why didn't I have eyes of understanding? Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I hear the warning greater? Why didn't I even hear my conscience? Anybody have those things? Why did I hear my conscience later? Why didn't you, like, smack me in the head? Why didn't you, and I have all of these different questions, right, for the Lord, and in his love, he begins to show those things of what he was doing, because with temptation, with trials, he makes way of escapes, he makes, uh, he makes rivers and dry places, he begins to show you what he's doing, and what he was doing, and if you hang out with him long enough, you'll begin to understand where he was, and what's transpiring now and how he's going to make it for good because that's our God. That's how he operates. 
So the book of Haggai, when you see this prophecy of God speaking to a prophet, can you guys say that God, ever point to God, spoke to the prophet and told him to speak to Zerubbabel. Can you guys say that? So, so God is sometimes will use uh, somebody who operates in the prophetic to speak. Now listen to what everyone else was speaking all around him. All around him, people were saying something different. But when God speaks either to you or to someone that you know has heard from the Lord, it changes the whole entire game plan. So listen to this. In Haggai, in the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, I mean, this is kind of some specific stuff. This is kind of like you writing down in your journal on January the 17th, 2000 and whatever. I mean, you're writing it down. Came the word of the Lord to Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel. It was, came to Haggai to Zerubbabel and to Joshua the son of Joseph the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this, this people saying the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So all of the people are saying the time is not what? It's not time. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you. So what is it? Everyone's saying it's not time, but they heard from the Lord, and the Lord's saying what? It's time. Now therefore... Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Give attention to your ways. Give attention to your thought. Give attention to the things you're thinking about. Give attention to the time you're spending in the word. Give attention to the meditation of your heart. Give attention to the way that you're conducting your business, conducting your time in time. Pay attention. Have you sown much? Are you you bringing in little? You're eating, but you've not had enough. You drink, but you're not filled with the drink. You have clothes on, but you're not warm. You've earned wages, but it just seems like you have a bag of holes in your pants. Your bags are just empty. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. Consider your thought life. Because with God, it's enough. With God, he provides. He makes makes a lot out of little. It's always enough. It always extends out. It always increases by faith. It actually multiplies by faith. So go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of my, my house that is waste. And you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you, now God's explaining something to him. This makes sense to me. Therefore the heaven over you, has paused. Everybody, anybody ever lived in a pause where time paused? This makes sense to me. Like, what happened? This is a shift in a season I'm not aware of. And it's as if time paused. And I went from a whole different season in my life to a whole new season. And it's as if time paused. So he's saying, he's explaining to them, you did all of these things, but now there's this shift where there's this understanding now that the heaven over you was paused. It stayed from dew. It paused from dew, and it's paused from her fruit. And I called for the drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and I've ca- and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle. So the pause came upon people and it came upon everything. It came upon all of your labor. It came upon all of the mountains. It came upon all of your food. It came on you. And, and he says, I've called for it. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shelethiel, and Joshua, the son of Jozedek, the king priest, which all of the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. In that pause, and the Lord saying, I am with you, I caused this to happen because God has a bigger work. He's orchestrating things that we can't see. And he's explaining this now to Zerubbabel. 
And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatil, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Zodedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts. So there's this, there's this interesting position that takes place. Like, why the pause, God? I don't understand. Before we go into chapter 2, there's this, he says he's going to shake the heavens, and, and he's going to do this work. And that the glory of this latter-day house is going to be greater. Because back there, you're like, I lost so much. I don't even understand why I would lose anything I was laboring for you. And yet he's saying, remember that big, huge temple? Remember how big and beautiful it was? And you guys are working on this little shindig thing. Kind of looks like a shack in comparison to what that looked like. And in your heart, you can feel like a loser because it doesn't seem like a whole lot. Like you remember what it was like. And you remember the glory that was there. You remember every, it seemed like everything was in unison. But God didn't have their heart the way he wanted it because that's why they, like, got kicked out of there. But now he's going to have their heart. And what's going to happen? He's saying here in verse 9 that the glory of this latter house, even though it looks like a little shindig, little thing to you in comparison to what you knew the former looked like, he said that the latter house is going to be greater than the former house. And this place, I will give you peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And he is in this position where there, he's showing that this glory is going to be greater than what you knew before. What you knew of God before is going to be greater. But what about that pause, God? Sometimes we have some questions in that pause. And when I'm going to talk to the pause right now, because some of you might be in that pause. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter, oh, excuse me. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Hey, here's your trial. So in that position of the pause, like I've like you have this pause over you. He, like he stayed everything. The the increase, it just you've lost. Although you're loving the Lord, it's almost as if you've lost favor with man. You've lost favor with your finances. You've lost favor with your cattle, your car, anything. I mean, just you can identify that there was like a favor that was lost. And you're kind of like, God, this does not make sense. Okay, what, what can God do in that? Verse, chapter 8, verse 1. All of the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all thy way which the Lord thy God led thee forty years in the wilderness. Here's your wilderness season in that pause. To stay hum, to humble thee. To stay humble. And to prove thee. To test you. To know what was in your own heart whether thou would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he suffered you to hunger, and to feed you with manna, and he fed you with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That's what he's saying. I'm going to teach you how to live under the rulership of my word apart from it's no longer about your cool thing that you can do or your car, the car that you think makes you or the hip-hop music that you think gives you your jive that makes you look cool till it's turned off, then you look like a ding-dong to everybody else, right? You look like a dummy, a fool. Whatever that thing is, God has to remove it all from you so that you will listen to him and his word and allow his word to be the thing that leads you because when the glory increases, you won't take the glory. You'll give him all the glory. And when he brings that increase of the house, you're going to go for people who are stuck in the pause. You're going to say, let God show you your heart. And you're going to be saying, not, his, not your will, but his will. And you'll begin to trust him in a greater way than, than ever before. So in my journey with loving the Lord, he began to operate through dreams, and I began to understand that he was speaking, and boy, I had hell on wheels operate through people with coming against the dreams. And I, and I 
and I know that God is growing you. Whatever God gifts you in, you will be refined in, and you will trust him in in a greater way. And in and, and, and this season that we're going into with our country, with our arcs that we're going to be preparing, whatever will God has for you, it's not your will, it's his will. You have to begin to listen to his voice. You'll have to learn whether he says go to Egypt or don't go to Egypt. You will have to listen to him. You will need to be led of his Holy Spirit, testing every spirit, but you will have to learn. So my dream last night, and then I'll switch back to my other dream that, uh, for preparing you for Grace Harbor. So my dream last night was of a girl who was led by mom and dad in a form of church. And in this house, it was a beautiful house, like the size of this house. And in this house, everything was sideways. The kitchen, we all walked sideways. And in the living room, we laid on the couch sideways. And you kind of, you know, if you lay, if the room is tilted and you're on the couch, you kind of have to, you would have some major abdominal oblique walls because you have to, like, lay a certain way so you don't roll off, right? So you're in this, you've learned how to lay on the couch in a sideways living room. You learned in the kitchen how to eat sideways. And I didn't quite get the dream just yet till the the back door, so if, if you go out the back door, if you go out the back door, these, there's these stairs, do, 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 and we're on the edge. And, and, and the, the, the door, the back door, you'd go down, down like four or five steps. There was a rope swing that was attached to the house, and she'd swing out over the cliff and then come back. And I'm like, that's really scary. Like, she would just jump on that rope swing. She'd swing out, out and over the crevasse, and then come back. But she swung really well. So what the Lord was showing me is she's learned to live on the edge. She learned to live on the edge, tipped over in her house. She, they taught her how to live on the edge with food and her lifestyle. They taught her how to live on the edge, even in this, in this what we would call an American Christian home. They taught her how, she'd learned how to live her life on the edge, and she lived on the edge really well on the edge of life playing. Like, she was a really good player on the edge. So I went to, back up those little stairs to the back door, and I went, and the wall ran long, and then there was, I have to go over here. There was, here's the back door, and here's the wall. And then the front door was right there. But you couldn't open the front door because this wall of the house was in the way. So the back door and the front door were similar, but you could go out the back door anytime. But the front door, she wasn't able to go through. But I could look in, and I could see it was a glass door, and I could see in the foundation. And I wanted to get a better picture. So I went, so you know where the rope swing was? That was a, there, was a, there was a long wall. And I could pull up the siding to look underneath to see. And I could see this foundation. And the foundation was as big as this room is. It was all rock. And I could see it. And in my dream, I was like, oh, my goodness, her parents could build her and start a house, a new house underneath this house. They could build it. And if they moved it back away from the edge and they moved it, they could move it and, and build a big house underneath this thing. I mean, they could start, and she would be safe, and she wouldn't have to live crooked, and she wouldn't have to live on the edge. And I just remember waking up, like, how many people have taught their children how to live on the edge in the TV room, in, in the kitchen, and they're eating, and in, in their life and playing on the edge. We don't have to build it on him. And you can rebuild. You, can you just go and build a house? You can build a spiritual house today. You can begin to build a house by, from the Lord today. He can begin to build your house by listening to him. He will begin to show you how to build your house so you're not living on the, the edge. And, and I read this girl's posts all the time. She's crying out. She doesn't have wisdom. She was not taught wisdom. Where do we go for God's wisdom, God's word? And if we will listen to his voice, listen, prophetic pro for prophecy, God's word always gets fulfilled and when it gets fulfilled there's warfare around the prophetic fulfillment like when jesus was born what was the warfare all of the babies were going to be what killed 
There's warfare. So when God gives you a promise and he gives you a prophecy and he's like saying to you, okay, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to restore your family in 10 years. If he says I'm going to restore everything and give you back everything that you thought you lost, I'm going to give you way more and the glory of it's going to be increased. Would you be willing to obey him and go after his will? Would you? It's going to be a storm. Would you? If you're willing. And that's what he's saying. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you that inheritance. I'm going to give it to you. I will give it to you if you will listen. If you will listen. So if we listen to the Lord, there was a day when the Lord said to me, okay, God, I don't know what's going on. This is right around COVID season. I said, I don't know what's really going on, but God, you need to tell me what you want me to do. It is I'm walking, and typically I don't hear you unless I'm quiet, but I'm walking. I was like walking downtown towards Hoquim, and I was doing a loop by the YMCA type of a thing. I think my kids were at the Y doing something. So I was walking, and I was like, God, I know it's loud, but you can speak through loud. I need you. I need to hear from you. You need to tell me what do you need me to do. He said, one, you're doing well at telling people to prepare without the spirit of fear. Because I could tell you to prepare and scare you at the same time, right? But he was telling me I was okay with that. And so telling people to prepare. So with that comes, okay, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in our area? What do you need for us to prepare for? Because I do see the flood waters. I see them increase. I do see... I do see the waves that are coming. I see the empty boats that are coming. I can hear the sound, this coming this way of things that I've not heard before that that I don't understand. Like I do see militant ships coming in. They come in like thin barges, little boats that I've not seen before. They pull in barges and military equipment on top of those thin barges, like barge boats that I've never seen before, like this big. They're long, and they've got little crafts, like little things that they maybe be able to drive on the land. And I see those come in. And, and so there was a day where um, Tiffany had heard the Lord say that, it, that it's going to be tumultuous times are coming. I'm like, okay, that's a big word. I don't even know how to spell that. And then I had heard the Lord say that tumultuous times were coming. Well, I was biking one day after all of these different seasons, and, and I was biking back from Hoquim. And I had said to the Lord, Lord, can you please tell me? And I was talking to him, and he beat my thought. Because I said, I was saying in my thought life, don't say the word tumultuous. Use a different word. Like, I I didn't want him to use that word. I wanted him to use a more of a descriptive word, because tumultuous is just kind of like famine or... I, I needed something, and he said kryptonic. Not kryptonite. I'm not talking that. I'm Krypton. Kryptonic. So I'm like, Kryptonic? What's that? So I began to do some studying in regards to Kryptonic, which means in Greek it means it's hidden. So Krypton is actually on the periodic table. And so it's going to be, I don't know how the enemy uses different things. I know how Hollywood uses it. It's colorless. It's odorless. It's tasteless. It's a gas. It's often used with other rare it, um, things such as fluorescent lamps, electronic spacecrafts. It helps produce electricity, com- um, t- electricity that compo- propels things. Um, Ukraine is the producer of 40% of all global krypton. Um, it's a, used in phones, televisions, um, helps to produce uh, the radios, the internet. It's a gas for energy. It's a high-speed f- um, uh, gas that they use in photography. The one thing that stood out to me was its laser light beams for holography um, and its semiconductor chips, which they use for like um, the, the lasers that they use for glaucoma or retinal trend. And so I kind of think that the Lord gives this to me a little bit because my husband, his degrees are in biochemistry. So I kind of think like because he's wise with worldly things but he also has a gift but I think God shows me this because I'm a simpleton in school and in comparison to his education so I think he kind of gives me scientific things to kind of like dumbfound my husband does that make sense is that kind of fair because sometimes I'll wake up in the night and I'll say something and I'll have a dream and I'll say what's a polypeptide and I just had a dream about saving polypeptides and he's like it's a protein so 
Uh, but I think that's, so sometimes your gifting isn't necessarily just for you. It's a part where you're going to mentor people who need it. Does that make sense? That are around you. So back to that Krypton. Um, when you see those laser light beams that they saw in Hawaii, those green laser light, I think the enemy is just, whether it's a gas that they use to try to freak people out, I mean, there's going to be lying signs and wonders, and however they do that in the sky, it, lying signs and wonders, just keep worshiping Jesus and let Jesus take your gifting through the storm and higher. Does that make sense? So if you don't understand what he's going to do with it and, and you are aware of how the enemy is using and it's freaking everybody out, including yourself, let him rise you higher because he's always bigger than the scheme of whatever the enemy is going to use. So I don't know. It, it, they use it and they mix it. Right now, Ukraine is being invaded. We can keep praying for Ukraine. But if Russia gets a hold of that Krypton, I, I mean, you guys can do more research study if that's where God wants you to go. But anyway, he said it was going to be Kryptonic. The, but if, if I tag team it with the word, when he spoke to me and I listened, and he said it's tumultuous, that means it's probably not going to be something good with gas. So what would God have us to do with that? Not, he doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but he does give us wisdom. So if God said to go to Egypt, go to Egypt. If he says not to go to Egypt, don't go to Egypt. If he says to build an ark, build an ark. If he says to go and purchase something that you will need or that your neighbor will need, just ask him. Ask him. He's not going to say no. He's going, and for years, people hear the voice of the Lord through visions, through dreams, through his word. That's going to be the safest thing because then you have a bigger view of what's going on because we only prophesy in part, but his word is going to be fulfilled, and it just gets deeper like a well. So when we, it, when we hear God's voice speak to us in regards to the storms that are ahead, it's almost like you're a light. It's a light for your feet, and, and, and people around you may be freaking out, but that light that you carry, I heard God say. So, for example, one other thing. This guy had had a dream. Uh, no, not a dream. He heard God's voice, and, the, and God told him to go on a fast for three days, and then I don't remember that part. Three days. So on day one, he goes on an airplane trip. Did you watch that video? He goes on an airplane trip. And the cabin, I mean, they're basically going to die. And this, everyone was freaking out around him. And he was remembering, God told me to go on a fast for three days, so he's not going to kill us. Like he was remember, encouraging himself, God, you told me to go on a three-day fast, and we're only on day one, so we're not going to die. Like he could clearly see where it was going in that storm by recalling what God had told him. Does that make sense? Like there's this intimacy that the Lord will speak to you in where you'll be like, I will live and not die. God, you, I'm on this three-day fast. Whatever it is, if you're in, it's, Kevin, it's so important that you continue. You were pointing on some points today where we can go through some dry seasons. We can go through days where, yeah, up and down, where we're not really hanging out with the Lord. But guess what's really neat when you're talking to the Lord and he begins to beat your thinking and your thoughts and he begins to encourage you and you catch things. And holding on to a scripture is a great way to think about what you're thinking about and encouraging yourself to grow in the faith because the days are going to get evil. But guess what? God says, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. So if you're in that season or you're in that dry season, God has, let him do his perfect work. Let him show you your heart. Let him show you what he's doing right now because there's a latter glory that's coming. There's greater glory that's coming. There's greater revelation that is coming. Just keep going after his will, after his plan. Let him lead you. And as we go through whatever we're going to go through here, Grace Harbor in America, let God get the glory. Let him lead us. We have to be people who are listened to his voice. He says, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways. And when you turn from your wicked ways, if you seek his face, you will hear from heaven. You will hear and you will see how he heals. And there's a lot of times there's a storm that comes in the healing process. And many won't be able to see it, but you will have a light on you 
His glory, his light, his power is towards us that believe. And his wisdom will be imparted unto you to be able to speak to people all around you. And, and to be able to see those devils casted out off of people, those spirits of fear, torment in the process is a beautiful thing. Doesn't that break your heart? I mean, doesn't this like make you well up with tears what's happening with these revivals right now? Are people, when people get set free from the demonic realm, it makes me choke. It makes me like, like I want a ball. Like freedom feels really good. Has anybody been like freed where they felt the demonic power left them and there's a freedom or in his presence there's a freedom? And that's, God has a good work in the work that he has in each one of your life. Let's raise your hands. Hold up your hands. That's you. God has a call. Let's Let's pray. Musicians can come. Raise your hand up. Say, Jesus, I ask that you would pour out your spirit. God, I'm going to allow you, God, to come and do whatever you want in me. I hold up my hand as an act of faith, as a, as a position of surrender. And I ask, Lord, that you would come and have your way in my life, that you would come and have your way in my heart, that, God, that my heart would not longer be wayward, but I would allow you to lead me. And, Lord Jesus... You do say that you do desire that we would prophesy. So today, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, an invitation for the Lord to work in, in your heart in that gifting area. Say, Jesus, I desire to prophesy. And the gifts that you have given to me, I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would fan it in the flames. Fan it into a flame that gifting that you have given to me to be useful for your purposes. Fan it into flames by faith. Increase it on Kevin. God, increase your kingdom in Kevin. May there be more capacity in his heart to be moved by you, by your word, by your presence. God, magnify your name to him. May you increase on him. Increase the house. As he spends time in your word, even in a fast, may he see there become an increase in the house on Timmy, Lord Jesus. As he spends time by believing you, by believing you, may there be an increase in that house as well, Lord Jesus. God, may each person who has their hand raised, even if I don't say your name specifically, and this is going out to you right now, God knows your name. You say your name. Say, my name is, say your name. Jesus, increase your anointing in my life to increase the house. God, we need your wisdom. We need your help, God. We are people here in Grace Harbor. God, we want to be able to help people. But God, we need your kingdom to come and your will to be done through our lives that, God, we might be able to see, God, your kingdom come upon our land, God. Not just at the gates, but for the whole entire county, the whole entire country, Lord Jesus. God, take this nation, take this land, take Grace Harbor. God, bring in your kingdom, bring in your presence that people would come and that they, when they come to church, God, they would fall on their knees, God, in repentance and that they would experience you in a way that they've never experienced you before. That's what's happening at, when, you, when you become awakened in, by him. That's what's happening at these revivals. Many people are encountering him in a way they've never encountered him before. Like time has stopped. God, in in other revivals, God, there were healings that took place. Emotional, physical healings that took place, God. Deliverance. God, your will be done in our area. Your will be done in our life, Lord. May we not be the same when we leave here. May we know today is a different day. I we take it by faith. Close your hand. Grasp your hand. Say, I take this by faith. If that's you, and you can hear the Holy Spirit nudging you, to say, I take this moment, I take this gift by faith. And God, train me. Train me to be used for your purposes. For our time here on earth is so short but it's all on a purpose that I don't always see, but you see the purpose. So God, lead me to your heart. Show me what you have for me, what your will is through my life, God, and help me to honor you in it. In 
Jesus' mighty name. Before we sing this last song, I want to give people an opportunity to surrender their lives to Jesus. I've been saying it. What does he want? He wants what? He wants everything. And like Don said, you know, what if this were our last night? Are you ready to meet Jesus? So anybody listening here or online right now, live or later, the Bible tells us if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. God so loved the world, he gave that great gift of love. Jesus laid down his life to give us life. He took our sin, he took our pain, our shame, our sorrow upon his back. His hands were pierced, his feet were pierced, crown of thorns on his head, he was spat upon, he was beaten beyond recognition, and he carried a heavy load, a heavy, heavy cross, but he was willing to do that for us. His desire is that none should perish, and his desire is that we would be with him in his kingdom. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it goes back to the garden. When sin entered the world, we were given free will. And we were, when Adam and Eve decided to go against God's word, we were born with a sin nature. And we needed a savior. And that's Jesus. So I'm going to pray. You want Jesus to be your Lord? to be your savior, to be that good shepherd that will lead you in the right path, the path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Just ask him. Those people that are on your heart that you're burdened for, that need freedom, all of us do. If there's something today that you want the Lord just to give you freedom and just raise your hand just as a, an acknowledging God, I've got this thing. You know what's on my heart. But first of all, let's pray, God, Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for mine. Thank you for paying that price. Thank you for making the way to be with you forever. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of the living God. I believe that you are God, and I want you to be mine. I want you, Holy Spirit, to be the one spirit that dwells in me, the one spirit that leads me, everything else at the cross. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. And this night, God, as I, as I come to you, open and humble, thank you for freeing me of the things that have kept me bound. Thank you for quickening my mortal body. Those places that may have once been alive that need rejuvenating. Thank you for doing that, God. The places that may have never been awakened to your truth in my spirit to yours, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to offer a sacrifice of worship. And we're going to sing out worship in you. This is the one that we were singing in scripture was coming up. Take the suffering that I bring Humbly I fall on my knees to proclaim your everything And my life's nothing without you Take my hand and lead me through You are my sustaining love I live
Proclaim, God, that you are everything. And my life is nothing without you. So, God, this day, take my hand and lead me. Lead me, God. I surrender my life to this day to you, God, in a whole new way. God, I thank you for meeting us. God, I thank you that you know our every need, God, and you know the things on our hearts. And, Lord, this day we just ask. We're asking. You say we have not because we ask not. And, God, we know that your will is life. God, speak life into those places that have been dry. Like Trisha said, like Kevin said. Trisha referred to Kevin. Those times, God, those times with you are so important. That one thing that is needful, like the story of Mary and Martha, I know I refer to it, but it's that time at your feet, listening and learning and gleaning what it is that you would have to say to us as individuals and corporately, God. May we be lights for you wherever we go, wherever we go. God, shine through us. May we not be in a hurry. May we take time, like Kevin even said, he himself is doing more ministry lately than he has in a long time. God, thank you for speaking that to him. God, thank you for using his life, for using Adam's life and Matthew's life and Dane's life and Michael's life and Jerry's life and Dawn's life and Kathleen's life and Timothy's life and Jackie's life and Trisha's and Scotland's and Britain's and Sir Elizabeth and Joshua and Bethany. Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? Grace and Richard, God, I thank you for their heart after you. God, I thank you for healing Richard. God, I thank you for healing him and restoring him as you have. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for that. God, as we go from this place, may we not just leave and forget about this night. God, if this could be the night that our our lives are required of us, God, may we be about your business all the days of our lives. When we hear your voice, when we hear your prompting, may we listen and may we walk in obedience, God. Thank you, God, for leading us all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, we praise you. We praise you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Those online, you're welcome to come next week. 
Um, I started a new series last week. You guys weren't here, but it was because of love. And last week I talked about basically number one, God has placed eternity in the heart of man. And that's all about Jesus. That's being with him. So next week we're going to continue on up through. I have got my messages like teaching every other week up through Mother's Day. Next week is going to be about the table. I haven't talked to Jerry yet, but can you share again in more detail about the table? Okay, so we're going to be talking about the new meal deal, (laughs) the new covenant meal, the new deal meal. So Jesus' covenant, redemption, he paid the price for us. So blessings, you can come join us in person, 3101 Cherry Street in Hoquiam. We'd love to have you here. Um, God is good all the time. May the Lord bless you. If you're listening, if you listen later, share it. Invite somebody to come. Blessings.